afternoon, and welcome to our production of The Winter's Tale. Please silence your cell phones and refrain from flash photography. There will be a recording of the play available for purchase at a later time. If you shall chance, Camillo, to visit Bohemia, on the like occasion whereupon my services are now in foot, you shall see, as I have said, great difference betwixt our Bohemia and your Cecilia. I think this coming summer the King of Cecilia means to pay Bohemia the visit which he justly owes him. Wherein our entertainment shall shame us, we will be justified in our loves, for indeed, beseech you. Verily, I speak in the freedom of my knowledge. We cannot with such magnificence, and so rare, I know not what to say. We will give you sleepy drinks, that your senses, Unintelligent of our insufficiency may, but they cannot praise us as they'll accuse us. You pay a great deal too dear for what's given freely. Believe me, I speak as my understanding instructs me, and as my honesty puts it to utterance. Cecilia cannot show himself over kind to Bohemia. They were trained together in their childhoods, and there rooted betwixt them then such an affection which cannot choose but branch now. Their encounters, though not personal, have been royally attorneyed, with interchange of gifts, letters, loving embassies, that they have seemed to be together. I think there is neither malice or matter in the world to alter. You have an unspeakable comfort in your young Prince Mamilius. is a gentleman of the greatest promise that ever came into my note. I very well agree with you in the hopes of him. It is a gallant child, one that indeed physics the subject, makes old hearts fresh. Nine changes as the watery star has been, a shepherd's note since we have last seen our throne. Without a burthen, time is long again, would be find up, my brother, without thanks. And yet we should, for perpetuity, go hence in debt, and therefore like a cipher, yet standing in rich place, I multiply with one, we thank you, many thousands more that go before it. Stay your thanks a while, and pay them when you part. Sir, that's tomorrow. I am questioned by my fears of what may chance or breed upon our absence that may blow no sneaping winds at home, to make a say that was put forth too truly. Besides, I have stayed to tire your royalty. We are tougher, brother, than you can put us to it. No longer stay. One seven night longer, then. Very sooth, tomorrow. We'll part the time betweens, then, and in that I'll no gainsaying. Press me not. Beseech you so. There is no tongue that moves, none, none of the world so soon as yours could win me. And so it should now were there a necessity in your request. Although, twere needful, I denied it. My affairs do even press me homeward, which to hinder were in your love a whip to me, my stay to you a charge and trouble. To say both, farewell, our brother. Tongue tie, our queen, speak you. I had thought, sir, to have held my peace until you had drawn oaths from him not to stay. You, sir, charge him too coldly. Tell him, you're sure all in Bohemia as well. This satisfaction the bygone day proclaimed. Say this to him. He is beat from his best ward. Well said, Hermione. To tell, he longs to see his son were strong. But let him say so then, and let him go. But let him swear so, and he shall not stay. We'll thwack him hence with distaffs. Yet, of your royal presence, I'll adventure the borrow of a week. When at Bohemia you take my lord, I'll give him my commission to let him there a month behind the just prefix for his party. Yet good deed, Leontes, I love thee not a jar of the clock behind what lady she her lord. You'll stay. No, madam. Nay, but you will. I may not, verily. Verily? You put me off with limber vows. But I, though you would seek to unsphere the stars with oaths, should yet say, Sir, no going. Verily you shall not go. A lady's verily is as potent as a lord's. Will you go yet? Force me to keep you as prisoner, not like a guest, so you may pay your fees when you depart and save your thanks. How say you, my prisoner or my guest? By your dread verily, one of them you shall be. Your guest then, madam. To be your prisoner should import offending, which for me is less easy to commit than you to punish. 
Not your jailer, then, but your kind hostess. Come, I'll question you of my lord's tricks and yours when you were boys. You were pretty lordings, then? We were, fair queen. Two lads who thought there was no more behind such a day tomorrow as today, and to be a boy eternal. Was not my lord the very wag of the two? We were as twinned lambs who did frisk at the sun, and bleed the, up, the one at the other. What we changed was innocence for innocence. We knew not the doctrine of ill-doing, nor dreamed that any did. Had we pursued that life, and our weaker spirits ne'er been reared by stronger blood, we should have answered heaven boldly, not guilty, the imposition cleared, heredity ours. By this we gather you have tripped since. <laughs> oh, my most sacred lady. <laughs> Temptations have since been born twos. For in those unfledged days was my wife a girl, your precious self, and not yet crossed the eyes of my young playfellow. Grace to boot. Of this make no conclusion, lest you say your queen and I are devils. Yet go on. The offenses we've made you do will answer. If you first sin with us, and that with us you did continue fault, and that you slip not with any, but with us. Is he one yet? He'll stay, my lord. At my request, he would not. Hermione, my dearest, thou never spokest to a better purpose. Never? Never but once. What? Have I twice said well? When was it before? My last good deed was to entreat his stay. What was my first? It has an elder sister, or I mistake you. Of oh, what her name were Grace. But once before I spoke to the purpose. When? Nay, let me have it, I long. Why, that was when three crabbed monks had soured themselves to death, ere I could make thee open thy white hand and clap thyself, my love. Then didst thou utter, I am yours forever. Tis grace indeed. Why, lo you now, I have spoke to the purpose twice. The one forever earned me a royal husband, the other for some while a friend. Too hot, too hot. To mingle friendship far is mingling blood. I have tremor cordis on me and my heart dances, but not for joy, not joy. This entertainment may a free face put on, derive a liberty from hardiness, from bounty, fertile bosom, and well become the agent. It may, I grant, <laughs> but to be paddling palms and pinching fingers as now they are, to be making practice smiles as in a looking glass, and then to sigh as twere the mort of the deer, oh, that is entertainment that my bosom likes not, nor my brows. Mamilius, art thou my boy? Aye, my good lord. What? Hast much thy nose? They say it is a copy out of mine. Come, captain, we must be neat. Not neat, but cleanly, captain. Art thou my boy? Yes, if you will, my lord. What means Cecilia? He something seems unsettled. How now, my lord? What cheer? How's with you, best brother? You look as if you held a brow of much distraction. Are you moved, my lord? No. In good earnest, how sometimes nature will betray its folly and make itself a pastime to harder bosoms. Looking on the lines of my boy's face, methought I did recoil twenty-three years and see myself unbreached. In my green velvet coat, my dagger muzzled, lest it should bite its master, and so prove as ornaments off do, too dangerous. How like, methought, I was to this squash, <coughs> this colonel, this gentleman, mine honest friend, Will you take eggs for money? No, my lord, I'll fight. You will? Why, happy man, be stole. <laughs> my brother, are you so fond of your young prince as we do seem to be of ours? And if at home, sir, he's all my exercise, my mirth, my matter. Now my sworn friend, then my enemy, my parasite, my soldier, statesman all. He makes a July's day as short as December, and with his varying childness cures in me thoughts that would tick my blood. So stands this squire, officed with me. We two will walk, my lord, and leave you to your graver steps. Hermione, how thou lovest us, showing our brothers welcome. Let what is dear in Sicily be cheap. Next to thyself and my young rover, he's a parent to my heart. If you would seek us, we are yours in the garden. Shall's attend you there. No, to your own vents dispose you. You'll be found view you beneath the sky. Gone already, inch thick, Knee deep, or had in years a forked one. Go play, boy, play. Thy mother plays, and I play too. So disgrace to part, whose issue will hiss me to my grave. Contempt and clamor will be my meal. Go play, boy, play. There have been, for I am much deceived, cuckolds ere now, and many a man there is holds his wife by the arm that little thinks she'd been sluiced in his absence. 
With bag and baggage, many thousand ones have the disease and feel it not. How now, boy? I am like you, they say. Why, that's some comfort. What, Camillo there? Aye, my good lord. Go and play, Mamilius. Thou art an honest boy. Camillo, this great sir will yet stay longer. You had much ado to make its anchor hold. When you cast out, it still came home. Didst note it. He would not say it your petitions, made his business more material. Didst perceive it. If you with me already, whispering, rounding, Cecilia's and so forth. Is far gone when I shall gust at last. How came it, Camillo, that he did stay? At the good queen's entreaty. <clears throat> At the queen's be it good. Should be pertinent. So it is. It is not. Was this taken by any understanding, paper thine, Camillo? For thy conceit is soaking. We'll draw in more than the common blocks. Not noted is it, but of the finer natures. Lower messes perchance out of this business. Pure blind, say. Business, my lord. I think most understand Bohemia stays here longer. Ha! Stays here longer. Aye, but why? To satisfy your highness and the entreaties of our most gracious mistress. Satisfy? The entreaties of your mistress? Satisfy? Let that suffice. I have trusted thee, Camillo, with all the nearest things to my heart. As well, my chamber counsels, wherein, priest-like, thou hast cleansed my bosom, and I from thee departed, thy penitent reformed. We have been deceived in thy integrity, deceived in that which seems so. Be it forbid, my lord. Had you not seen, Camillo, that's passed out. You have, or your eyeglass is thicker than a cuckold's horn. Or heard, or to a vision so apparent, rumor cannot be mute. Or thought, or cogitation resides not in the man that does not think my wife is slippery. I would not be a stander by to hear my sovereign mistress clouded so, without my pre pre present vengeance taken. Shrew my heart, you never spoke what did become you less than this, which to reiterate were sin as deep as that, though true. His whispering, nothing. His leaning cheek to cheek, his meeting noses, kissing with the inside lip, stopping the career of laughter with a sigh, a note infallible of breaking honesty, forcing foot on foot, Skulking in corners, wishing clocks more swift, hours, minutes, noon, midnight, and all eyes blind with the pen and web but theirs, theirs alone. That would indeed be wicked. Is this nothing? But then the world and all that's in it is nothing. Bohemia, nothing. My wife, nothing. Nor nothing have these nothings if this be nothing. Good my lord, be cured of this disease opinion and be times, for tis most dangerous. Say it be, tis true. No, no, my lord. It is. You lie, you lie. Canst with thine eyes at once see both good and evil, inclining to them both. Were my wife's liver infected as her life, she would not live the running of one glass. Who does infect her? Why, he that wears her like a metal hanging about his neck. Bohemia, who, if I had servants true about me, that bear eyes to see like mine honor as their own prophets, their own particular thrifts. I, and thou, his cupbearer, whom I from meaner form have benched and reared to worship, who may see plainly as heaven sees earth, and earth sees heaven how I am galled, might spice a cup to give mine enemy a lasting wink, which dropped to me were cordial. Sir, my lord, I could do this and with no rash potion, but with a lingering dram that would not work maliciously like poison. But I cannot believe this craft to be in my dread mistress. So sovereignly being honorable, I have loved thee. Make that thy question and go rot. Dost think I am so muddy, so unsettled to appoint myself in this vexation? Sully the purity and whiteness of my sheets, which to preserve is sleep, which being spotted as goads, thorns, nettles, tails, or wasps, gives scandal to the blood of a prince, my son, whom I do think is mine, and love is mine, without right moving to it. Would I do this? Can man so blench? I must believe you, sir. I do, and will fetch off Bohemia for it. Provided that, once he's removed, you will take back your queen again as yours at first, even for your son's sake, and thereby foresealing the injury of tongues in courts and kingdoms, known and allied to yours. Thou dost advise me. Even as I mine own course have set down, I'll give no blemish to her honor, none. My lord, go then and with countenance as clear as friendship wears at feast, keep with Bohemia and with your queen. 
I am his cupbearer. If from me he hath wholesome drink, account me not your servant. This is all. Do it, and thou hast the one half of my heart. Do it not, and thou splittest thine own. I'll do it, my lord. I will seem friendly as thou hast advised me. O oh, miserable lady, but for me what case stand I in? I must be the poisoner of good Polyxanes, and my ground to do it is the obedience to a master, who in rebellion with himself will have all that are his so too. To do this deed, promotion follows. If I could find examples of thousands that have struck anointed kings and flourished after, I'll not do it. But since nor brass, nor stone, nor parchment bears not one, let villainy itself forswear it. I must forsake the court. To do it or no is certain to me a breakneck. Happy star, reign now. Here comes Bohemia. This is strange. He thinks my favor, he begins to warp. Not speak. Good day, Camilla. Hail, most royal sir. What is the news of the court? None rare, my lord. The king hath on him such a countenance, as he had lost some province in a region, loved as he loved himself. Even now I met him with customary compliment, when he, wafting his eyes to the contrary and dropping a lip of much contempt, speeds away and leaves me to consider what is breeding that changeth thus his manners. I dare not know, my lord. How? Dare not? Do you know and dare not? Camillo, your changed complexions are to me a mirror, which show me my change too, for I must be a party in this alteration, finding myself thus altered with it. There is a sickness which puts some of us in his temper, but I cannot name the disease, and it is caught of you that yet are well. How? Caught of me? Make me not sighted like the basilisk. I have looked on thousands who have sped the better by my regard, but killed none so. Camillo, as you are certainly a gentleman, if you know aught which does behoove my knowledge, thereof to be informed, imprisoned not in ignorant concealment. I may not answer. A sickness caught of me, and yet I will. I must be answered. Dost thou hear, Camillo? I conjure thee by all the parts of man which honor doth acknowledge. Sir, I will tell you, but since I am charged in honor, and by him whom I think honorable, therefore mark my counsel, which is to be even as swiftly followed as I mean to utter it. For both yourself and me cry lost, and so good night. On, good Camilla. I am appointed him to murder you. By whom, Camilla? By the king. For what? He thinks, nay, with all confidence, he swears that you have touched his queen forbiddenly. Oh, then my best blood be turned to an infected jelly. My name be yoked with this that did betray the best. Swear his thought over by each particular star in heaven and by all their influences. You may as well forbid the sea for to obey the moon, as or by oath remove or counsel shape the fabric of his folly, which is piled upon his faith, and will continue the standing of his body. How should this grow? I know not, but I am sure tis safer to avoid what's grown than question how tis born. If therefore you dare trust my honesty, which lies enclosed in this trunk which you shall bear along in pond, away tonight. Your followers, I will whisper to the business and will, by twos and threes at several posterns, clear them of the city. For myself, I'll put my fortunes to your service, which are here by this discovery lost. Be not uncertain, for by the honor of my parents, I have uttered truth. If you seek to prove it, I dare not stand by, nor are you safer than any man condemned by the king's own mouth, thereon his execution sworn. I do believe thee. I saw his heart in his face. Take my hand. Be pilot to me, and thy places shall still neighbor mine. My ships are ready, and my people did expect my hence departure two days ago. This jealousy is for a precious creature, and as she's rare must it be great, and as his person's mighty must it be violent, and as he does conceive that he is betrayed by a man that ever professed to him, why in that must, re must his revenges be made the more bitter. Fear o'ershades me. Good expedition be my friend, and comfort the queen part of his theme, but nothing of this ill tan suspicion. Come, Camilla, let us avoid. It is in mine authority to command the keys of all the posterns. Please, your highness, to take the urgent hour. Sir, away.
cast you. Come, my gracious lord. Shall I be your playfellow? No, I'll none of you. Why, my sweet lord? You'll kiss me hard and speak to me as if I were a baby still. Black brows, they say, become some woman best, so that there be not too much hair there. In a semicircle, or a half moon made with a pen. Who taught you this? I learned it out of women's faces. Pray now, what color are your eyebrows? Blue, my lord. Nay, that's a mock. I have seen a lady's nose that has been blue, but not her eyebrows. Hark ye, the queen your mother rounds apace. She is spread of late into a goodly bulk. Good time encounter her. What wisdom stirs amongst you? Come, sir, I am for you again. Pray you sit by us and tell us a tale. Merry or sad shall it be? As merry as you will. A sad tale is best for winter. I have one of sprites and goblins. Let's have that then. Come on and do your best to fright me with your sprites. You're powerful at it. There was a man dwelt by a churchyard. I'll tell it softly. Yon cricket shall not hear it. Come on then, and give it me in my ear. What's he meant there? His train. Camilla with him. Behind the tough pines I met. Never saw I met scour so upon the way. I eyed them, even to their ships. How blessed am I in my just censure, in my true opinion. A lack for lesser knowledge, how accursed in being so blessed. There may be in the cup a spider steeped, and one may drink and yet partake no venom, for his knowledge is not yet infected. But if one present the abhorred ingredient to his eye, and make known how he hath drunk, he cracks his gorge, his sides with violent hecht. I have drunk and seen the spider. Camilla was his help in this, his pander, his plot against my life, my crown. All's true that is mistrusted. That false villain whom I employed was pre-employed by him. And I remain a pinched thing. Yea, a very trick for them to play at will. How came the postern so easily open? By his great authority, which often hath no less prevailed than so on your command. I know it too well. Give me the boy. I'm glad you did not nurse him. Though he does bear some signs of me, yet you have too much blood in him. What is this, sport? Bear the boy hence. He shall not come about her. Away with him, and let her sport herself with that she's big with. For tis Polyxanes has made thee swell thus. But I'll say he had not, and I would be sworn you would believe my saying. However you lean to the nay word. You, my lords, look on her. Mark her well. Be but about to say, she's a goodly lady. Oh, I am out. That mercy does. For calumny will see her virtue itself. These shrugs, these hums and haws. When you have said, she's goodly. Come between ere you can say, she's honest. But be it known, from him that has the most cause to grieve it should be. She's an adulteress! Should a villain say so? The most replenished villain in the world. He were as much more villain. You, my lord, do but mistake. No. If I mistake in these foundations which I build upon, the center is not big enough to bear a schoolboy's top. Away with her! To prison! He who shall speak for her is a far off guilty but that he speaks. There's some ill plan it reigns. I must be patient till the heavens look with an aspect more favorable. <laughs> Good, my lords. With thoughts so qualified as your charities shall best instruct you, measure me, and so the king's will be performed. Shall I be heard? Who is it that goes with me? I beseech your highness, my women may be with me, for you see my plight requires it. Do not weep, good fools, there is no cause. When you shall know that your mistress has deserved prison, then abound in tears as I come out. This action I now go on is for my better grace. Adieu, my lord. I never wish to see you sorry. Now I trust I shall. Go, do our bidding, hence. Be seated, your highness. Call the queen again. Be certain what you do, sir. Lest your justice provides, which you three brave would suffer, yourself, the queen, and your son. For her, my lord, I dare my life to doubt, and will do it, sir. Please you to accept it that the queen is spotless in the eyes of heaven and to you. I mean in this which you accuse her. It is for you we speak, Mindel. <clears throat> Sorry, lie. It what? It if it proves she's otherwise, I'll keep my stables where I lodge my wife. I'll go in couples with her, and when I feel and see her, no farther trust her for every other inch of woman in the world, I, every gem of woman's flesh, be false if she be. Hold your pieces. Good, my lord. It is for you we speak, not ourselves. You are abused, and by some putter on will be damned for it. Would I knew the villain, I'll then damn him, be she on a flood. I have three children, the eldest eleven, the second and third nine, and some five. If this be true, they will pay for it by mine honor. Cease. No more. You smell this business with a sense as cold as is in a dead man's nose. 
but I do see it and feel it as you feel doing thus, and with all the instruments that feel. If it be, we need no grave to bury honesty. There's not a grain of it the face to sweeten the whole dungy earth. What? Lack I credit? I had rather you did lack than I, my lord, upon this ground. And more will content me to have her honor true than your suspicion. Be blamed for it how you might. Why, what need we commune with you of this, but rather follow our forceful instigation? Our prerogative calls not your counsels. We need no more of your advice. The matter, the loss, the gain, the ordering on it, is all properly ours. And I wish, my liege, you had only in your silent judgment tried it without more overture. How could that be? Either thou art most ignorant by age, or thou art born a fool. Camillo's flight added to their familiarity. I have dispatched in post to sacred Delphos, Cleomenes and Dion, whom you know of stuff sufficiency. Now from the oracle they will bring all. Whose spiritual counsel had, shall stop, or spur me. Have I done well? Well done, my lord. Though I am satisfied, and need no more than what I already know, so shall the oracle give rest to the minds of others, such as he whose ignorant credulity will not come up to the truth. So from our free person we have thought it good she should be confined, lest that the treachery of the two flood hence be left her to perform. Come, we are to speak in public, for this business will raise us all. To laughter, as I take it, if the good truth were known. and called to him, let him have knowledge who I am. Good lady, no court in Europe is too good for thee. How dost thou then in prison? Now, good sir, you know me, do you not? Poor worthy lady, and one too much I honor. Pray you then, conduct me to the queen. I may not, madam. To contrary, I have expressed commandment. Here's a due to lock up honesty and honor from the access of gentle visitors. Is it lawful, pray you, to see her women, any of them, Amelia? So please you, madam, to put apart these your attendants. I shall be Amelia forth. Pray you then call her, withdraw yourselves. And, madam, I must be present at your conference. Well, be it so, prithee. Here's such a do to make no stain a stain as passes coloring. Dear gentlewoman, how fair is our gracious lady? hath born greater. She is something before her time delivered. A boy, a daughter, and a goodly babe, lusty and like to live. The queen receives much comfort in it, says, my poor prisoner, I am innocent as you. These dangerous, unsafe loons of the king beshrew them. He must be told on, and he shall. The office becomes a woman best. I shall take it upon me. And if I prove honey mouth, let my tongue blister, and never to my red looked anger be the trumpet any more. Pray you, Amelia, commend my best obedience to the queen. If she dares trust me with her little babe, I shall show it to the king, and undertake to be her advocate to the loudest. Do not know how he may soften o'er the sight of the child. The silence often of pure innocence persuades when speaking fails. Most worthy, madam, your honor and your goodness is so evident that your free undertaking cannot miss a thriving issue. There is no lady living so meet for this great errand. Please, your ladyship, to visit the next room. I'll presently acquaint the queen of your most noble offer, who but today hammered of this design, but durst not tempt a minister of honor, lest she should be denied. Tell, you, tell her, Amelia, I'll use the tongue I have, and if wit flow from it as boldness from my bosom, let it not be doubted, I shall do good. Now be you blessed for it, I'll off to the queen. Please you, come something near. If it please a queen to send a babe, I know not why I shall incur to pass it, having no warrant. You need not fear it, sir. The babe was prisoner to the womb, and is by law and process of great nature, thence freed and enfranchised, not party to the anger of the king, nor, if any be, the trespass of the queen. I do believe it. Then do not you fear, upon mine honor I'll stand betwixt you and danger.
<laughs> nor night, nor day, no rest. It's but weakness to bear the matter thus, mere weakness. If the cause were not in being, part of the cause, she's the adulteress. The harlot king is quite beyond mine arm, out of the blank and level of my brain, plot proof. But she I can hook to me, say that she were gone, given to the fire. A moiety of my rest might come to me again. Who's there? My lord. What is the business? How does the boy? Um, he took great rest tonight. His hope is sickness is discharged. To see his nobleness, conceiving the dishonor of his mother, he straight declined, dropped, took it deeply, fastened and fixed the shame on it in himself, threw off his spirit, his appetite, his sleep, and down where it languished. Leave me solely. Go, see how he fares. Fie, fie, no thought of him, no thought of my revenges that way recoil upon me, in himself too mighty, in his parties, his alliance. Camillo and Paul Xanis laugh at me, make their pastime at my sorrow. He should not laugh if I could reach them, nor shall she within my power. You must not enter. Nay, rather good, my lord, be second to me. Fear you more his tyrannous passion, alas, than the life of the queen. A gracious, innocent soul, more free than he is jealous. That's enough. Madam, he is not asleep tonight. Commend it, none shall come at him. Not so hot, good sir. I come to bring him sleep. To such as you that sigh at each his needless heavings, such as you are the cause of his awaking. I come with words as medicinal as true, honest as either, to purge him of that humor that presses him from sleep. What noise there? Ho! No noise, my lord, but needful conference about some gossips for your highness. How? Away with that audacious lady! Antigonus, I charge thee that she should not come about me. I knew she would. I told her so, on her displeasure's peril, and on mine she should not visit you. What? Canst not rule her? From all this honesty he can, in this, unless he take the course you have done, commit me from committing honor, trust it, he shall not rule me. La, you now, you here, when she will take the reins, I'll let her run, but she'll not stumble. Good, my liege, I come, and I beseech you, who profess myself your loyal servant, your physician, and your most humble counselor, yet that dare less appear so in comforting your evils than such as most seem yours. I say I come from your good queen. Good queen? Good queen, my lord, good queen. I say good queen, and would by combat make her so were I a man, the worst about you. Force her hands. Let him that make but trifles of his eyes first hand me. On mine own accord I'll off, but first I'll do mine errand. The good queen, for she is good, hath brought you forth a daughter. Here tis, commends it to your blessing. Out, a mankind witch, most intelligencing bawd. Forever unvenerable be thy hands, if thou takest up the princess by that forced baseness he has put upon it. Traitors. Dreads his wife, so were I you did. Then twere past all doubt you'd call your children yours. He dreads his wife. A nest of traitors. I am none by this good light. Nor I, nor any but one that's here. And that's himself. For he, the sacred honor of himself, his queens, his hopeful sons, his babes, betrays to slander, whose sting is sharper than the swords and will not. For as the case now stands, it is a curse he cannot be compelled to it. Once remove the root of his opinion, which is as rotten as ever oak or stone was sound. A coward of boundless tongue, who late hath beat her husband, and now baits me. This brat is none of mine, is the issue of Polyxanes. Hence with it, and together with the dame, commit them to the fire. It is yours. Might we lay the old proverb to your charge, so like you tis the worst. Behold, my lord, though the print be little, the whole copy and matter of the father. Eyes, nose, lip, the trick of the frown, his forehead, nay, the valley. The pretty dimples of chin and cheek, his smiles, the very mold and frame of hand. Once more, force her hands. A most unworthy and unnatural lord can do no more. I'll have thee burnt. I care not. It is an heretic that makes the fire, not she which burns in it. I'll not call you tyrant for this most cruel usage of your queen, not able to produce more accusation than your own weak hinged fancy, something savors of tyranny, and will ignoble make you, yea, scandalous to the world. On your allegiance, out of the chamber with her. 
Were I a tyrant, where were her life? She durst not call me so if she did know me one. Away with her! I pray you do not push me. I'll be gone. My lord, look to your babe. Tis yours. To have sent her a better guiding spirit. What needs these hands? You that are thus so tender o'er his follies will never do him any good. Not one of you. So, so farewell. We are gone. Thou traitor, set on thy wife to this. My child, away with it. Even thou that is a heart so tender or rich, take it up straight. Within this hour, bring me word tis done. By good testimony, or I'll seize thy life. I did not, sir, but these lords, my noble fellows, if they please, can clear me in it. We can, my royal liege. He is not guilty of her coming hither. You're liars all. Beseech your highness, give us better credit. We have always truly served you, and beseech you so to esteem of us. And on our knees we beg, as recompense for our dear services, past and to come, that you do take back this purpose, which being so horrible, so bloody, must lead unto some foul issue. We all kneel. I am a feather for each wind that blows. Shall I live on to see this bastard kneel and call me father? Better burn it now than curse it then. But be it. Let it live. What will you adventure to save this brat's life? Anything, my lord, that my ability may undergo and nobleness impose upon the little blood which I have left. Anything to save the innocent. It shall be possible. Swear on your life that thou wilt perform my bidding. I will. We enjoin thee, as thou art liege man to us, to carry this female baby hence, to some remote and desert place quite out of our dominion, and that there thou leave it, without more mercy, to its own protection in favor of the climate. As by some strange fortune it came to us, I do in justice charge thee, on thy soul's peril, and thy body's torture, that thou commend it strangely to some place, where chance may nurse or end it. Take it up. I swear to do this, though a present death has been more merciful. Come, poor babe, some powerful spirit instruct thy kites and ravens to be thy nurses. Wolves and bears, they say, casting their savagness aside, have done like offices of pity. Blessing against this cruelty, fight on thy side. Poor thing, condemned to loss. Please, your highness, post of those you sent to the oracles are come, an hour since, Cleomenes and Dion, being well arrived from Delphos, are both lended, hasting to the court. So please you, sir, their speed hath been beyond account. Twenty-three days they have been absent. Tis good speed. Foretell us the great Apollo suddenly will have the truth of this appear. You, my lords, summon a session, that we may arraign our most disloyal lady. For as she hath been publicly accused, so shall she have a just and open trial. While she lives, my heart will be a burden to me. Go, and think upon our bidding. The climate is delicate, the air most sweet, fertile the isle, the temple much surpassing the common praise it bears. I shall report, for most it caught me, celestial habits, methinks I so should term them, and the reverence of the grave warriors. Oh, the sacrifice, how ceremonious, solemn, and unearthly, it was in the offering. But of all, the burst and the ear-deafening voice of the oracle, kin to Jove's thunder, so surprised my sense that I was nothing. If the event of the journey prove as successful to the queen, well, be it so. Death then to us rare, pleasant, speedy. Time is worth the use on it. Great Apollo, turn all to the best. These proclamations, so forcing faults upon, upon Hermione, I little like. The violent carriage of it will clearer end the business. When the oracle, thus by Apollo's great divine, shall the contents discover something rare. Even then will rush to knowledge. Go, fresh horses, and gracious be the issue.
This sessions, to our great grief we pronounce, even pushes against our heart. The party tried, the daughter of a king, our wife, and one of us too much beloved. Let's be cleared of being tyrannous, since we so openly proceed in justice, which shall have due course, even to the guilt or the purgation. Produce the prisoner. It is his highness's pleasure that the queen appear in person here in court. Silence! Read the indictment. Hermione, queen to the worthy Laontes, king of Sicilia, thou art here accused and arraigned of high treason, and committing adultery with Polyxenes, king of Bohemia, and conspiring with Camilla to take away the life of our sovereign lord, the king, your royal husband, the pretense whereof being by circumstances partly laid open. Thou, Hermione, contrary to the faith and allegiance of a true subject, didst counsel and aid them for their better safety to fly away by night. Since what I am to say must be that which contradicts my accusation, and the testimony on my part no other but which comes from myself. It scarce can boot me to say not guilty. Mine integrity being counted as falsehood shall, as I express it, be so received. But thus, if powers divine behold our human actions as they do, I doubt not then, but innocence shall make false accusation blush and tyranny tremble at patience. You, my lord, best know, who least would seem to do so. My past life hath been as continent, as chaste, as true, as I am now unhappy, which is more than history can pattern, though devised and played to take spectators. For behold me, a fellow of the royal bed, which owe a moiety of the throne, a great king's daughter, mother to a hopeful prince, here standing to prate and talk for life and honor, for whoever pleased to come in here. For life, I prize it as I weigh grief, which I would spare. For honor, tis a derivative from me to mine, and only that I stand for. I appeal, sir, to your own conscience, before Polyxenes came to your court, how I was in your grace, how merited to be so since he came, with what encounter so uncurrent I have strained to appear thus. If one jot beyond the bound of honor, or an act or will that way inclining, hardened be the hearts of all that hear me, and my nearest of kin cry fie upon my grave. I ne'er heard yet that any of these bolder vices wanted less impudence to gainsay what they did than to perform it first. That's true enough, though tis a saying, sir, not due to me. You will not own it. More than mistress of which comes to me in the name of fault, I must not at all acknowledge. For Polyxenes, with whom I am accused, I confess, I loved him as an honor he required, with such a love as might become a lady like me, with such a love so and no other as yourself commanded, which not to have done, I think would have been in me both disobedience and ingratitude toward you and toward your friend, whose love had spoke, even since it could speak, from an infant freely that it was yours. Now for conspiracy, I know not how it tastes, though it be dished for me to try how. All I know of it, is that Camilla was an honest man, and why he left your court, the gods themselves, wanting no more than I, are ignorant. You knew of his departure, as you know what you have undertaken to do in his absence. Sir, you speak a language I understand not. My life stands level with your dreams, which I'll lay down. Your actions are my dreams. You had a bastard by Polyxenes. Thy brat hath been cast out, like to itself, no father owning it. So thou shalt feel our justice, in whose easiest passage look for no less than death. Sir, spare your threats. The bug which you would fright me with I seek. <clears throat> to me can life be no commodity. The crown and comfort of my life, your favor, I do give lost. For I do feel it gone, though I know not how it went. My second joy, the first fruits of my body, from his presence I am barred like one infectious. My third comfort, starred most unluckily, is from my breast, the most innocent milk in its most innocent mouth, hailed out to murder. Now, my liege, tell me what blessings I have here alive that I should fear to die. Therefore proceed, but hear this, mistake me not. No life, I prize it not a straw, but for mine honor, which I would free if I should be condemned upon surmises. All proof sleeping else but what your jealousies awake. I tell you tis rigor and not law. Your honors all, 
I do refer me to the oracle. Apollo be my judge. This your request is altogether just. <laughs> Therefore, bring forth, and in Apollo's name, his oracle. You here shall swear upon this sort of justice that you, Cleomenes and Dion, have been both at Delphos, and from thence have brought the sealed up oracle, by the hand delivered of great Apollo's priest, and that, since then, you have not dared to break open the holy seal, nor read the secrets in it. All this, this we swear. swear. Break open the seals and read. Hermione is chaste, Polyxenes blameless, Camillo a true subject, Leontes a jealous tyrant, his innocent babe truly begotten, and the king shall live without an heir, if that which is lost be not found. Now blessed be the great Apollo. Praised. Hast thou heard the truth? Ay, my lord, even so as it is here set down. There is no truth at all in the oracle. The sessions shall, pr shall proceed. This is mere falsehood. What is it? Oh, I shall be hated to report this. The prince, your son, whose mere conceit and fear to queen speed is gone. How? Gone? Is dead. The heavens themselves do strike at my injustice. How now? These words are mortal to the queen. Look down and see what death is doing. Her, her heart is but overcharged. She will recover. Beseech you. Tenderly apply to her some remedy for life. Apollo, pardon my great profaneness against thine oracle. I'll reconcile me to Polyxenes, new woo my queen. Recall the good Camillo, whom I proclaim a man of truth, of mercy, for being transported by my jealousies to bloody thoughts and to revenge. I chose Camillo for the minister to poison my good friend Polyxenes which had been done, but that the good mind of Camillo tardied my swift command, though I with death and rewards did threaten and encourage him. Not doing it and being done, he unclasped my practice. How oh, his pity does my deeds make the blacker. Oh, woe the while, cut my laces as my heart cracking it break too. What fit is this good lady? What studied torments tyrant has for me, what wheels, racks, fires, what flame boiling in leads or oils, what old or newer tortures must I endure, whose every word deserves to taste of thy most worst. Thy tyrannies along with thy jealousies, fancies too weak for boys, too green and idle for girls of nine. Oh, think what they are doing, and run mad indeed, stark mad, for all thy bygone fooleries were but spices of it. That thou betrayedest Polyxanes, t'was nothing, that did but show thee of a fool, inconsistent and damnable and grateful. Nor was it much that thou wouldst have poisoned good Camillo's honor to have him kill a king. Poor trespasses, more monsters standing by, whereof I reckon the casting to the crows of thy baby daughter to be or little or none, though a devil would have shed water out of fire and done it. Nor can it be laid to thee the death of the young prince, whose honorable thoughts, thoughts high for one so tender, cleft the heart that could conceive a more gross and foolish sire blemished his gracious stay. This is not no laid to thy answer. But when I have said the last, O Lord's cry, woe! The queen, the sweetest, dearest creature, is dead. And vengeance for it not dropped down yet. The higher powers forbid. I say she is dead, I'll swear it. If words nor oath prevail not, go and see. You can bring tincture or luster to her lips, heat outwardly or breath within. I'll serve thee as I do the gods. But, O oh, thou tyrant, do not repent of these things, for they are far monstrous than all thy woes can stir. Therefore, betake thee to nothing but despair. A thousand knees, ten thousand years, together naked fasting on barren mountain and still winter and storm perpetual, cannot move the gods to look that way thou wert. Go on. Go on, thou canst not speak too much. I have deserved all tongues to talk their bitterest. Say no more, however the business goes. 
You have made faults in the boldness of your tongue. I am sorry for it. All my faults, when I shall come to know them, I do repent. Alas, I've shown too much the rashness of a woman. He is touched to the noble heart. Forgive a foolish woman, sire, that I have minded you of what you forget. Rather, I beseech thee, do not receive affliction at my petition. Let me be punished that I have minded you of what you should forget. The love I bore your queen. Lo, fool again, I'll say nothing of her, nor of your children. I'll not remember you of my own lord, who is lost to. Take your patience to you, I'll say nothing. Thou didst speak but well when most the truth, which I received much better than to be pitied of thee. For thee, lead me to the dead bodies of my queen and son. One grave shall be for them both. Upon them shall the causes of their death appear, and to our shame perpetual. Once a day, I'll visit the chapel where they lie, and tears shed there shall be my recreation, so long as nature will bear up with this exercise, so long I daily vow to use it. Come and lead me unto these sorrows. <coughs> Thou art perfect, then. Hath the ships touched upon the base of Bohemia? Aye, my lord, and fear we have landed in ill time. The skies look grimly and threaten present lusters. In my conscience, the heavens without we have in hand are angry and frown upon us. Let their sacred wills be done. Go, get aboard, look to thy bark. I'll not be long before I call upon thee. Make your best haste, and go not too far in the land. Tis like to be loud weather. Besides, this place is famous for the creatures of prey that keep upon it. Go thou away. I'll follow instantly. I am glad heart to be through the business. Come, poor babe, I have heard, not believe the spirits of the dead may walk again. If this be true, thy mother appeared to me last night, for now is a dream, so like a waking. Did this break from her, good Antigonus, since fate against thy better disposition, hath made thy person the throw out of my poor babe, according to thy note. Perdita, I pray thee call it, and I do believe Hermione hath suffered death, and that Apollo would, this being indeed the issue of King Polyxanes, shall be laid here, either life or death, upon the earth of its right father. The storm begins, poor wretch, that for thy mother's fault art thus exposed to loss and what may follow. Farewell, the day frowns more and more, thou art like a lullaby too rough. I've never seen the heavens so dim by day, well, may I get aboard? This is a chase. I am gone forever. No! No! Stop! No! Stop! No! 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 with child, wrong in the ancient tree, stealing, fighting, hark you now. But any but these boiled brains of nineteen and two and twenty hunt this weather. 
They have scared away two of my best sheep, which I fear the wolf will sooner find than the master. If anywhere I have them, tis by the seaside, browsing of ivy. Good luck, and it be thy will, what have we here? Mercy on us, a baron, a very pretty baron. A boy or a child, I wonder. A pretty one, a very pretty one. Sure, some escape. Though I am not bookish, I read the winning gentlewoman in the escape. This has been some stair work, some trunk work, some behind door work. They were warmer that got this, and the poor thing is here. I'll take it up for pity, yet I'll tarry till my son comes. He hallowed, but even now. Well, ho, ho! Hello, hello! What, art so near? If thou wilt see a thing to talk on when thou art dead and rotten, come hither. What ailest thou, man? I have seen two such sights, but by, by sea and by, by air. But I am not to say it is a sea, for for it is now the sky. But betwixt the firmament in it, you cannot thrust a bodkin's point. Why, boy, how is it? I, I would you did but see how it, how it chafes, how it rages, how it takes up the shore. But that's not the point. Oh, the most piteous cry of the poor souls. Sometimes to see him and not to see him. Now the ship bore the moon with her main mast, and anon swelled with yes and froth as you thrust a cork into a hogshead. And then for the land service to see how the bear tore out his shoulder boat. And he cried to me for help and said his name was Antigonus, a nobleman. But to make an end of the ship, to see how the sea flap dragoned it. But first, how the poor souls roared, and the sea mocked them. And how the bear and the, and the poor gentleman roared, and the bear mocked them both roaring louder than the sea or weather. In the name of mercy, when was this, boy? Now, now! I have not winked since I saw these sights. The men are not yet cold underwater, nor the bear hath dined on the gentleman. He's at it now! But I have been by to have helped the old man. <sighs> I would you have been by the ship's side to help her. There your charity would lack footing. Uh, heavy matters, heavy matters. Well, look thee here, boy, now bless thyself. Thou madest with things dying, I with things newborn. Here's a sight for thee. Look thee, a bearing cloth for a squire's child. Look thee here, boy. Open it. It was told me I should be rich by the fairies. This is some changeling. Open it. What's within, boy? You're a maid, old man. If the sins of your youth are forgiven you, you're well to live. Gold! All gold! Tis very gold, boy, and 'twill prove so. Up with it. Keep it close. Home, home, the next way. We are lucky, boy. And to be so still requires nothing but secrecy. Let go. my sheep go. No. Go you the next way with your findings. I'll go see if the bear be gone from the gentleman and how much he hath eaten. They are never cursed but when they are hungry. If there be any of him left, I'll bury it. Well, that's a good deed. And if thou may discern by that which is left of him what he is, fetch me to the sight of him. Mary will I, and you shall help to put him in the ground. Tis a lucky day, boy, and will do good deeds on it. <laughs> and terror of good and bad that makes an bold error. Now take upon me, in the name of time, to use my wings. Impute it not a crime to me or my swift passage that I slide o'er sixteen years and leave the growth and tried of that wide gap. Since it is in my power to o'erthrow a law and in one self-born hour to plant an o'erwhelm custom, let me pass the same I am, ere the ancient disorder was, or what is now received. I witness to the times that brought them in, so shall I do, to the freshest things now reigning, and make stale the glistering of this present, as my tale now seems to it. Your patience is allowing, I turn my glass, and give my scene such grime, as you had slept between. Leontes leaving, the effects of his fond jealousy so grieving, that he shuts up himself. Imagine me, gentle spectators, that I now may be in fair Bohemia, and remember well, I mentioned a son of the kings which Florizel I now name to you, and with speed so pace to speak of Perita, no groan and grace, equal with wondering what of her ensues which follows after is the argument of time. Of disallow, if ever you have spent time worse ere now, if never, yet that time herself doth say she wishes you earnestly never may.
I pray thee, good Camilla, be no more importunate. Tis a sickness denying thee anything, a death to grant this. It is fifteen years since I saw my country, though I have for the most part been heir to broad. I desire to lay my bones there. Besides, the penitent king my master hath sent for me, to whose feeling sorrows I might be some allay, or I or ween to think so, which is another spur to my departure. As thou lovest me, Camilla, wipe not out the rest of thy services by leaving me now. The need I have of thee, thine own goodness hath made. Better not to have had thee than thus to want thee. Of that fatal country, Cecilia, prithee speak no more, whose very naming punishes me with the remembrance of that penitent, as thou callest him, and reconciled king, my brother, whose loss of his precious queen and children are even now to be afresh lamented. Say to me, when sawest thou the Prince Florizel, my son? Sir, it is three days since I saw the Prince. What as happy our affairs may be are to be unknown. But I have missingly noted he is of late much retired from the court, and is less frequent to his princely exercises. I have considered so much, and with much care, so far as I have eyes under my intelligence that look upon his removedness, from whom I have this intelligence, that he is seldom removed from the house of the most homely shepherd, a man, they say, that from very nothing, and beyond the imagination of his neighbors, has grown into an unspeakable estate. I have heard, sir, of such a man, who hath the daughter of most rare note. The report of her is extended more than can be thought to begin from such a cottage. That is likewise part of my intelligence. But I fear the angle that plucks our son thither. Thou shalt accompany us to that place, where we shall, not appearing as we are, have some question with the shepherd, from whose simplicity I think it not uneasy to get the cause of my son's resort thither. For thee, be my present partner in this business, and lay aside the thoughts of Cecilia. I willingly obey your command. My best Camillo, we must disguise ourselves. When daffodils begin to spring, with hay, the doxy over the dale, why then comes in the sweet of the year, for the red blood reigns in the winter's pale? I have served Prince Florizel, and in my time wore three pile, but now I'm out of service. But should I go and mourn for that, my dear? The pale moon shines by night, and when I wander here and there, I then do most go right. My father named me Autolycus, who being as I am, littered under mercury, was likewise a snapper up of unconsidered trifles. With dye and drab I purchased this comparison, and my revenue is the silly cheat. Gallows and knock are too powerful on the highway. Beating and hanging are tears to me. For the life to come, I sleep out the thought of it. A prize! A prize! Let me see. Every leaven weather Todd, every Todd yields pound and odd shilling. Fifteen hundred shorn. Oh, what comes the wool to? If the springe hold, the cock's mine. I can't do without counters. Let me see. What am I to buy for our sheep shearing feast? Three pound of sugar, five pound of currants, rice. What will this sister of mine do with rice? But my father hath made her mistress of the feast, and she lays it on. She hath made me four and twenty nosegays for the shearer, shearers, and three men saw men all, and very good ones. But they are most of them needs and faces. But one Puritan amongst them, and he sings psalms to hornpipes. I must have saffron to color the warden pies. Mace. Dates? None that's out of my note. Hmm. Nutmeg seven, a racer to a ginger for that I may beg. Hmm. Four pound of prunes, and as many of raisins. Oh, the sun! Oh, that oh. I was born! In the name of me! Oh, help me, help me, flood but off these rags, and then death, death! Alack, poor soul, thou hast a need of more rags to lay on thee rather than have these off. Oh, sir, the loathsomeness of them offends me more than the stripes I have received, which are mighty ones and millions. Alas, poor man, a million of beating may come to a great matter. I am robbed, sir, and beaten. My money and apparel are taken from me, and these detestable things put upon me. What, by a horseman or a footman? A footman, sweet sir, a footman. Indeed, he should be a footman by the garments he has left with thee. If this be a horseman's coat, it hath seen very hot service. Let me thy hand. I'll help thee. Come on, let me thy hand. Oh, good sir, softly, good sir. Alas, poor man. Oh, good sir, softly, good sir. I fear, sir, my shoulder blade is out. Oh, no, can't stand? Oh, good sir, softly, good sir. You have done me a charitable office. Dost like any money? I no, have no good money sir, for sir. thee. I beseech you, sir. 
It would kill my heart. What manner of fellow is he that robbed you? A fellow, sir, that I've known to go about what troll my names. I knew him once of the servant of the prince. I cannot tell you, good sir, for which of his virtues it was, but he was certainly whipped out of court. His vices, you would say. There's no virtue whipped out of the court. They cherish it to make it stay there, and it will no more but abide. Vices, I would say, sir. I know this man well. He has since been an ape bearer, then a process server, a bailiff. Then he compassed the motion of a prodigal son. I married a tinker's wife within a mile of where my li land and living lies. And having flown over many knavish professions, he settled only in Rome. Some call him Autolycus. Out upon him, prig for my life, prig! He haunts wakes, fairs, and bear baitings. He, sir, he, that's the rogue that put me into this apparel. Not a more cowardly rogue in all Bohemia. If you had but looked big and spat at him, he'd have run. I must confess to you, sir. I'm false of heart that way. And that he knew, I warrant him. How does thou now? I can stand and walk. I will even take leave of you. Shall I bring thee all the way? No, good face, sir. No, sweet sir. Then fare thee well. I must go buy spices for our sheep shearing feast. Prosper you, sweet sir. I'll be with you at your sheep shearing, too. And if I make not this cheat bring out another, and the shears move sheep, let me be unrolled and my name put in the book of virtue. Jog on, jog on, the footpath way, and merrily head the style way. A merry heart goes all day, your sad tires in a mile way. These your unusual weeds to each part of you do give a life. No shepherdess but Flora, peering in April's front. This your sheep shearing is as a meeting of the petty gods, and you the queen on it. Sir, my gracious lord, to chide at your extremes it not becomes me. O oh, pardon that I name them, your high self, gracious mark of the land you have obscured with the swains wearing, and me, poor lowly maid, most goddess-like pranked up but that our feasts in every mess have folly, and the feeders digest it with custom. I should blush to see you so attired, sworn, I think, to show myself a glass. I bless the time when my good falcon made her flight across thy father's ground. Now Jove affords you cause to me the difference forges dread. Your greatness hath not been used to fear. Even now I tremble to think that your father by some accident should pass this way as you did. Oh, the fates! How should he look to see his work so noble, vilely bound up? What should he say? Or how should I in these borrowed flaunts behold the sternness of his presence? Apprehend nothing but jollity. The gods themselves, humbling their deities to love, have taken the shapes of beasts upon them. Jupiter became a bull and bellowed, the green Neptune a ram and bleated, and the fire-robed god, golden Apollo, a poor humble swain as I seem now. Their transformations were never for a piece of beauty rare nor in a way so chaste, since my desires are not before mine honor, nor my lusts burn hotter than my faith. Oh, but sir, your resolution cannot hold when tis opposed, as it must be by the power of the king. One of these two must be necessities, which then will speak, that you must change this purpose, or I my life. Thou dearest Perdita, with these forced thoughts, I prithee darken not the mirth of the feast, or I'll be thine, my fair, or not my father's. Be merry, gentle, Strangle such thoughts as these with anything to behold the while. O oh, Lady Fortune, stand you auspicious. See your guests approach. Address yourself to entertain them sprightly and let's be red with mirth. Daughter, hostess of the meeting, pray you, bid these unknown friends to's welcome. For it is a way to make us better friends, more known. Come, quench your blushes and present yourself, that which you are, Mr. So the Feast, and bid us welcome to your sheep cheering, as your good flock shall prosper. Sir, welcome. It is my father's will that I should take on me the hostesship of the day. You're very welcome, sir. Give me those flowers there, Dorcas. Reverend sirs, for you there's rosemary and rue. These keep seeming in savor all the winter long. Grace and remembrance be to you both, and welcome to our shearing. Shepherdess, the fair one are you. Well you fit our ages with flowers of winter. Sir, the year growing ancient, not yet on summer's death, nor on the birth of trembling winter. The fairest flowers of the season are our carnations and streaked gillivers, which some call nature's bastards. Of this kind are rustic gardens barren, and I care not to get slips of them. Wherefore, gentle maiden, do you neglect them? I have heard it said there is an art which in their pineness shares with great creating nature. Say there be, 
Yet nature is made better by no mean, but nature makes that mean. So over that art would you say, as to nature, it's an art that nature makes. You see, sweet maid, we marry a gentler scion to the wildest stock, and may conceive a bark of baser kind to the bud of noble race. This is an art which does mend nature, change it rather, but the art itself is nature. So it is. So make your gardens rich in julivers, and do not call them bastards. I'll not put a dibble in the earth to set one slip of them. Here's flowers for you. Hot lavender, mints, savory marjoram, the marigold which goes to bed with the sun, and with him rises weeping. These are flowers of middle summer, and I think they are given to men of middle age. You're very welcome. What you do still betters what is done. When you speak sweet, I'll have you do it ever. When you sing, I'll have you buy and sell so. So give alms, pray so. And for the ordering of your affairs, to sing them too. When you do dance, I wish you a wave of the sea, that you might ever do nothing but that. Move still, still so, and own no other function. Each your doing, so singular in each particular, crowns what you are doing in the present deed, that all your acts are queens. O oh, Doricles, your praises are too large, but that your youth and the true blood which peepeth fairly through it do plainly give you out an unstained shepherd. With wisdom I might fear, my Doricles, you wooed me the false way. I think you have as little skill to fear as I have purpose to put you to it. But come, our dance, I pray your hand, my Perdita. This is the prettiest lowborn lass that ever ran in the green sward. Nothing she seems or does but smacks of something greater than herself. Too noble for this place. He tells her something that makes her blood look out. In sooth, she is the queen of herds and cream. Oh, come on, strike up! Mopsa must be your mistress, marrying garlic to men her kissing with. Now in good time. Not a word, a word! You stand upon our manners. Come on, strike up! Pray, good shepherd, what fair swain is this which dances with your daughter? They call him Doricles, and boasts himself to have a worthy feeding. But I have it upon his own report, and I believe it. He looks like sooth. He says he loves my daughter. I think so, too, for never gaze the moon upon the waters as he stands and reads as for my daughter's eyes. And, to be plain, I think they're not half a kiss to choose who loves another best. She dances featly. So she does anything, though I report it that should be silent. If young Doricles do light upon her, she will bring him that which he not dreamed of. Alas, if you did but hear the peddler at the door, you would never dance again after a tabor and pipe. No, the bagpipe could not move you. He sings several songs faster than you'll tell money. He utters them as he had eaten ballads and almonds ears grew to his tunes. He could never come better, he shall come in. I love a ballad, but even too well. If it be a doleful matter, merrily set down or a very pleasant thing indeed, but sung lamentably. He has songs from man and woman of all sizes. No milliner can so fit his customers with gloves. He has the prettiest love songs for maids. Whoop, do me no harm, good man. Puts him off slight him with whoop, do me no harm, good man. This is a bright fellow. Believe me, thou talkest of an admirable, conceited fellow. Has he any unbraided wares? He has ribbons of in the colors of the rainbow. Points more than all the lawyers in Bohemia could learnedly handle, though they come to him by the gross. Inkles, caddises, cambrics, lawns. While he sings them over, they are gods or goddesses. You'd think a smock were a she-angel, he's so chance to sleeve hand and the work about the square on it. Prithee bring him in and let him approach singing! Forewarn him that he use no scurrilous words in his tunes. You have of these peddlers that have more in them than you think, sister. I, good brother, or go about to think. Former lads to give their dears, pins and poking sticks of steel. What maids lack from head to heel, come by of me, come by. Buy, lads, or else your lasses cry. If I were not in love with Mopsa, thou shouldst take no money of me. 
So being enthralled as I am, it will also be the bondage of certain ribbons and gloves. I was promised some against the feast, but they come not too late now. He hath promised you more than that, or there be liars. He hath paid you all he promised you, maybe hath paid you more, which would shame you to give them again. Is there no manners left among maids? Will they wear their plackets where they should bear their faces? Is there not milking time when you're going to bed or kiln hole to whistle off these secrets? But you must be tittle-tattling before all our guests. Tis well you are whispering. Clamor your tongues and not a word more. I have done. Come, you promised me a tawdry lace and a pair of sweet gloves. Have I not told thee how I was cozened, by the way, and lost all my money? And indeed, sir, there are cozeners abroad. There are but behooves men to be wary. Fear not, thou man. Thou shalt lose nothing here. I hope so, sir. For I've bought me many parcels of charge. Huh. What has here? Ballots? Pray you now, buy some. I love a ballot and print alike, for then we are sure they are true. Here's one to a very doleful tune. How a usurer's wife was brought to a bed of twenty money bags at a birthday. How she longed to eat adder's heads and toads carbonado. Is it true, thank you? Very true, and but a month old. Bless me for marrying a usurer. Here's the midwife's name on it. One mistress tail porter and five or six honest wives that were present. Why should I carry lies abroad? Pray you now, buy it. Lay it by. Let's first hear more ballads. We'll buy the other things anon. Here's another ballad of a fish that appeared on the coast on Wednesday, the fourth score of April. 40,000 fathom above the water, and sung this bout against the hard hearts of maids. It was said she was a woman, and was turned into a cold fish, because she not, would, would not exchange a kiss with the one that loved her. It is very pitiful, and that's true. Is it you too, think you? Five justices' hands at it, and witnesses more than my pack will hold. Lay it by to another. Why, this is a merry ballad, but a very pretty one. Let's have some merry ones. Why, this is a passing merry one. It goes to the tune of two maids wooing a man. Scarce a maid westward, but she sings it. Tis in request, I can tell you. We can both sing it. If thou wilt bear a part, thou shalt hear. Tis in three parts. We had a tune on it a month ago. I can bear my part. You must know, tis my occupation. Have at it with you. Get you hence, for I must go, where it fits you not to know. Whither? A whither? Whither? It becomes I owe for well. Thou to me thy secrets tell. Me too, let me go thither. Or thou goest the orange or male? If to either, thou goest ill. Neither. What, neither? Neither. Thou hast sworn my love to be. Thou hast sworn it more to me. Then whither goest, say whither? We'll have this song out and by ourselves. My father and the gentlemen are a sad talk and will not trouble them. Come away with thy pack after me. Wenches, I'll buy for you both. Heather, let's have the first choice. Follow me, girls. And you shall pay well for them. Will you buy any tape or lace for your cape, my dainty duck, my dear A? Any silk, any thread, any toys for your head of the newest and finest wear A? Come to the peddler, money's a meddler that doth utter all men's where eh? Is it not too far gone? Tis time to part them. He's simple and tells much. How now, fair shepherd? Your heart is full of something that does take your mind from feasting. Sooth, when I was young and handed love as you do, I was wont to load my she with gnats. I would have ransacked the peddler's silken treasury and poured it to her acceptance. Old sir, I know she prizes not such trifles as these are. The gifts she looks for me are packed and locked within my heart, which I have given already, but not delivered. Well, hear me breathe my life before this ancient sir, who it should seem hath sometime loved. I take thy hand, this hand as soft as doves down, and as white as it. What follows this? How prettily the young swain seems to wash the hand was fair before. I have put you out, but to your protestation, let me hear what you profess. Do and be witness to it. And this my neighbor too? And he, and more than he, and men, the earth, the heavens, and all, that were I crowned the most imperial monarch, there of most worthy, were I the fairest youth that ever made eyes swerve, had force and knowledge more than was ever man's, I would not prize them without her love, for her employ them all, commend them and condemn them to her service, or to their own perdition. Fairly offered. This shows a sound affection. But, my daughter, say you the like to him? I cannot speak so well. Nothing so well, no, nor mean better. By the pattern of my own thoughts, I cut off the purity of his. Take hands, a bargain, and, friends unknown, you shall bear witness to it. I give my daughter to him, and will make her portion equal his. Oh, that must be in the virtue of your daughter, one being dead. I shall have more than you can dream of yet. Enough, then, for your wonder. But, come on, contract us for these witnesses. Come, your hand, and daughter yours. Stop, Swain, a while, beseech you. Have you a father? I have, but what of him? Knows he of this? He neither does nor shall. Methinks the father is at the nuptial of his son a guest. Pray you once more. 
Is your father grown incapable of reasonable affairs? Can he speak, hear? No man for man, dispute his own estate. Lies he not bedrid, and again does nothing but what he did being childish? No, good sir, he has his health and ampler strength, indeed than most have of his age. By my white beard, the father, all whose joys in nothing else but fair posterity, should hold some counsel in such a business. I yield all this, but for some other reasons, my grave sir, which tis not fit you know, I not acquaint my father of this business. Let him know it. He shall not. Prithee, let him. No, he must not. Uh, let him, my son. He shall not need to grieve at knowing of thy choice. Come, come, he must not. Mark our contract. Then mark it a fourth. Sir, sir, whose son I dare not call, thou art too base to be acknowledged. Thou was scepter's heir that thus affects a sheep hook. And thou, old traitor, I am sorry that by hanging thee I can shorten thy life but a week. And thou, fresh piece of excellent witchcraft, who force must know the royal fool thou copest with. Oh, my heart! Thou have thy beauty scratched with briars and made more homely than thy estate. For thee, fond boy, that if I may ever know that thou dost but sigh, that thou no more shalt see this snack, as never I mean thou shalt. I'll bar thee from secession, not wholly of our blood, no, not our kin. And you enchantment, if ever henceforth thou these rural latches to his entrance open, or hoop his body more with thy embraces, I will devise a death as cruel for thee as thou art tender to it. Even here undone, I was not much afeard, for once or twice I was about to speak and tell him plainly. The selfsame sun which shines upon his court hides not his visage from our cottage, but looks on alike. Will it please you, sir, be gone? I told you what would come of this, beseech you, of your own state, take care. This dream of mine, being now awake, I'll queen it no inch further, but milk my ewes and weep. <coughs> Why, how now, father? Speak, ere thou diest. Uh, I cannot speak, nor think, nor dare to know that which I know. Oh, sir, you have undone a man of fourscore three. Why look you so upon me? I am but sorry, not afeard, delayed but nothing altered. What I was, I am, more straining on for plucking back, not following my leash unwillingly. My lord, you know your father's temper. Till the fury of his highness settle, come not before him. I not purpose it. I think, Camillo? Even he, my lord. Let nature crush the sides of the earth together and mar the seeds within. Lift up thy looks from my succession, whitely, father, I am heir to my affection. This is desperate, sir. So call it, but it does fulfill my vow. I needs must think it honesty. Camillo, not for Bohemia will I break my oath to this, my fair beloved. Therefore, I pray you, as you have ever been my father's honored friend, when he shall miss me, as in faith, I mean not to see him any more. Cast your good counsels upon his passion. Let myself and fortune tug for the time to come. I am put to sea with her whom here I cannot hold on shore. What course I mean to hold shall nothing benefit your knowledge, nor concern me the reporting. Oh, my lord, I would your spirit were easier for advice, or stronger for your need. Hark, pretty, I'll hear you by and by. He's irremovable, resolved for flight. Now were I happy, if his going I could frame to serve my turn, save him from danger, do him love and honor, purchase again the sight of dear Cecilia, for whose sight I thirst to see. Well, my lord, if you may please to think I love the king, and through him what is nearest to him, which is your gracious self, embrace but my direction. I'll point you where you shall have such receiving as shall become your highness, where you may enjoy your mistress, marry her, and with my best efforts in your absence, your discontenting father strive to qualify and bring him up to liking. How, Camillo, may this almost a miracle be done? Have you thought on a place where you'll go? We profess ourselves to be the slaves of chance and flies to every wind that blows. Then listen to me. Make for Sicilia, and there present yourself in your fair princess. Methinks I see Leontes opening his free arms and weeping his welcomes forth. Ask thee the son forgiveness as twere in the father's person. Worthy Camillo, what color for my visitation shall I hold it before him? Sent by the king your father, to greet him and to give him comforts. The manner of your bearing towards him, with what you as from your father shall deliver, I'll write you down, things known betwixt us three. What you must say, that he shall not perceive, but that you have your father's bosom bare, and speak his very heart. I am bound to you. There is some sap in this. Your pardon, sir, for this I'll bless you, thanks. My pretty Spredita, but, oh, the thorns we stand upon, Camillo, preserver of my father, now of me, medicine of our house, how shall we do? We are not furnished like Bohemia's son, nor shall appear in Sicilia. My lord, fear none of this. I think you know my fortunes do all lie there. 
It should be so my care to have you royally appointed, as if the scene you play were mine. Ha ha, what a fool honest he is, and trust your sworn companion, a very simple gentleman. I have sold all my trumpery. They throng with your vipers, as if my trinkets had been hollow, and brought a benediction to the buyer. By which means I saw whose purse was best in picture, and what I saw to my good use I remembered. I picked and cut most of their festival purses, and had not the old man come in with a woo-bub against his daughter and the king's son, and scared the chops of my chaff, I had not left a purse alive in the whole army. Nay, but my letters, by this means being there so soon as you arrive, shall clear that doubt. And those that you'll procure from King Leontes? Shall satisfy your father. Happy be you, for all that you speak shows fair. Who have we here? We'll, we'll make an instrument of this. Omit nothing, may give us aid. If they have overheard me now, why, hanging? How now, good fellow? Why shakest thou so? Here's no harm intended to thee. I'm a poor fellow, sir. Why be so still? Here's nobody will steal that from thee. Yet for the outside of thy poverty, we must make an exchange. Therefore, discase thee instantly. Thou must think there's some necessity in it, and change garments of this gentleman, though the pennyworth on his side be the worst. Yet hold thee, there's some boot. I'm a poor fellow, sir. I know ye well enough. Nay, prithee, dispatch. The gentleman's half late already. Are you in earnest, sir? I smell the trick on it. Dispatch, I prithee. Indeed, I have had earnest, but I cannot with conscience take it. Unbuckle, unbuckle. Fortunate mistress, let my prophecy come home to ye. You must retire yourself into some covert. Take your sweetheart's hat and pluck it o'er your brows. Muffle your face, dismantle you. And as you can, dislike in the truth of your own seeming, that you may, for I do fear eyes over, get to shipboard undescribed. I see the place so lies that I must bear a part. No remedy. Have you done there? Should I now meet my father, he would not call me son. Nay, you shall have no hat. Come, lady, come. Farewell, my friend. I do, sir. Oh, Perdita, what have we twain forgot? Pray you a word. What I do next shall be to tell the king of this escape, and whither they are bound. Wherein my hope is, I shall so prevail to force him after. In whose company I shall reap you, Cecilia, for whose sight I have a woman's longing. <laughs> Fortune speed us. Thus we set on, Camillo, to the seaside. The swifter speed, the better. I understand the business. I hear it. Have an open ear, a quick eye, and a nimble hand is necessary for a cut purse. A good nose is requisite also. A smell at work for the other senses. I see that this is the time that the unjust men doth thrive. What an exchange this has been without boot. What a boot is here with this exchange. Sure, the gods do connive at us, and we may do anything extempore. The prince himself is but a piece of iniquity, stealing away from his father with his clog at his heels. If I thought it were a piece of honesty to acquaint the king with all, I wouldn't do it. I hold it the more knavery to conceal it, and there am I constant to my profession. See, see, what a man you are now. There is no other way but to tell the king she's a changeling and none of your flesh and blood. Nay, but hear me. Nay, but hear me. Go to, then. She being none of your flesh and blood, your flesh and blood has not offended the king, and so your flesh and blood is not to be punished by him. Show those things you found about her. I will tell the king all, every word, yea, and of his son's pranks, too. Very wisely, puppies. Well, let us to the king. There's that, and this Sparta will make him scratch his beard. I know not what impediment this complaint may be to the flight of my master. Pray hardly be at palace. Though I'm not naturally honest, I'm so sometimes by, sometimes by chance. Let me pocket up my peddler's excrement. How now, rustics? Whither are you bound? Uh, to the palace, and I like your worship. Your affairs here? What with whom? And anything that is fitting to be known, discover. We, we are but plain fellows, sir. A lie. You are rough and hairy. Let me have no lying. Are you a courtier, and it the like to you? Whether it like me or no, I'm a courtier. Seest thou not the air of these in courts and these enfoldings? Has not my gait in it the measure of the court? Or sees not thy nose court odor for me? I am a courtier copper pay, and one that will either push on or pluck back thy business here, whereupon I command thee to open up thy affair. This cannot be but great courtier. His garments are rich, but he wears them not handsomely. He seems to be a more noble and being fantastical. A great man, I'll warrant, I know by the pickings on his teeth. What's I the fartle? Wherefore that box? 
Uh, sir, there lies such secrets in this Bartleman box which none may know but the king, and which he shall know within the hour if I may come to the speech of him. The king is not at the palace. He's gone aboard a new ship to purge melancholy and to air himself. For thou be as capable of things serious, thou must know the king is full of grief. So tis said about his son that should have married a shepherd's daughter. If that shepherd be not in hand fast, let him fly. The curses he shall have, the tortures he shall feel, will break the back of man, the heart of monster. Thank you so, sir. Not he alone shall suffer what wit can make heavy and vengeance bitter, but those that are germane to him, though removed fifty times, shall all come under the hangman. Though be a great pity, yet it is necessary. An old sheep whistling rogue, a ram tender, to offer to his daughter come into grace? Has the old man heired a son, sir? He is a son, who shall be flayed alive, then anointed over with honey, set on a head of a wasp nest to be three quarters in a dram dead. But what talk we of these traitorly rascals, whose miseries are to be smiled at, their offenses being capital? Tell me, for you seem honest, plain men, what you have to the king. Being suddenly gently considered, I'll bring you to where he's aboard. Tend your persons to his presence. Whisper him in your behalf. And if there be a man besides the king to effect your suits, here's the man that shall do it. He seems to be of great authority. Close with him, give him gold. And it please you, sir, to undertake the business for us. Here is that gold I have, and I'll make it as much more and leave this young man in pawn till I bring it you. After I've done what I promised? Aye, sir. Well, give me a moody. Are you a party in this business? In some sort, sir. But though my case be a pitiful one, I hope I shall not be laid out of it. Oh, that's the case of the shepherd's son. Hang him! He'll be made an example of. Good comfort, good comfort. We must to the king and show her strange sights. He must know tis none of your daughter, nor my sister. We are gone else. Sir, I will give you as much as this old man does when the business is performed. And remain, as he says, till your pawn be brought you. I will trust you. Walk before toward the sick side. Go on the right hand. I'll but look upon the hedge and follow you. We are blessed in this man, as I may say, even blessed. Well, that's before as he bids us. He was provided to do us good. If I had a mind to be honest, I see fortune would not suffer me. She drops booties in my mouth. I am courting now with a double occasion, gold and the means to do the prince my master good, which who knows how that may turn back to my advancement. To him, the king, I will present them. There may be matter in it. and have performed a saint-like sorrow. No fault could you make which you have not redeemed. Indeed, pay down more penitence than have done trespass. At the last, do as the heavens have done. Forget your evil. With them, forgive yourself. Whilst I remember her and her virtues, I cannot forget my blemishes in them, and so still think of the wrong I did myself, which was so much that airless it hath made my kingdom and destroyed the sweetest companion that air man bred his hopes out of. True, too true, my lord. If, one by one, you wedded all the world, or from the all that are, took something good to make a perfect woman, she you killed would be unparalleled. I think so. She I killed. I did so. But thou strikest me sorely to say I did. It is as bitter on thy tongue as is in my thought. 
Not at all, my good lady. You might have spoken a thousand things that would have done the time more benefit and graced your kindness better. You are one of those who would have him what again? If you would not so, be pity not the state, or the remembrance of his most sovereign name. Consider little what dangers, by his highness's fail of issue, may drop upon his kingdom and devour in certain lookers on. There is none worthy respecting her that's gone. Besides, the gods would have fulfilled their secret purposes. For has not the divine Apollo said, is it not the tenor of his oracle, that King Leontes shall not have an heir till his lost child be found? Which that it shall is all as monstrous to our human reasoning as my Antigonus to break his grave and come again to me, who on my life did perish with the infant. Tis your counsel, my lord, to the heavens be contrary, oppose against their wills. Care not for issue, the crown will find an heir. Great Alexander left his to the worthiest, so his successor was like to be the best. Good Paulina, oh that ever I had squared me to thy counsel. Then, even now, I might have looked upon my queen's full eyes, have taken treasure from her lips, and left them more rich for what they yielded. Thou speakest truth, no more such wives, therefore no wife. One worse and better used would make her sainted spirit again possess her corpse. And on this stage where we're offenders all, appear soul vex and begin, why to me? Had she such power, she had just cause. She had, and would incense me to murder she I married. I should so. Were I the ghost that walked, I'd bid you mark her eye, and tell me for what dull part in it you chose her. Then I'd shriek that even your ears should rift to hear me, and the words that followed should be, remember mine. Stars, stars, and all eyes else dead colds. Fear thou no wife, I'll have no wife, Paulina. Will you swear never to marry, but by my free leave? Never. So be blessed, my spirit. Then, good my lords, bear witness to his oath. You tempt him overmuch. Unless another as like Hermione as is her picture affront his eye. Madame! I have done. Yet, my lord will marry. If you will, sir, no remedy, but you will. Give me the office to choose you a queen. She shall not be so young as was your former, but she shall be such as. Walked your first queen's ghost, it should take joy to see her in your arms. Good Paulina, we shall not marry till thou biddest us. That shall be when your first queen's again in breath, never till then. One that gives out himself, Prince Florizel, son of Polyxanes, with his princes, she the fairest I have yet beheld, desires access to your high presence. What of him? He comes not like to his father's greatness. His approach, so out of circumstance and sudden, Tells us tis not a, not a visitation framed, but forced, by need and accident. What train? But few, and those but me. His princess, say you with him? I, the most peerless piece of earth, I think, that e'er the sun shone bright on. Oh, Hermione, as every present time doth boast itself above a better gone, so must thy grave give way to what seem now. Sir, you yourself had said and read so. But your writing now is colder than that theme. She had not been, nor was not to be equaled. Thus your verse flowed with her beauty once. To shrewdly ebb to say you've seen a better. Pardon, madame. The one I have almost forgot, your pardon. The other, when she has obtained your eye, will have your tongue too. This is a creature, would she begin a sect, might quench the zeal of all professors else, make proselytes of who she but bid follow. How? Not women. Women will love her, that she is a woman more worth than any man, men that she is the rarest of all women. Had our prince, jewel of children, seen this hour, he had pair well with us, Lord. There was not a full month between their birth. Prithee, cease. Thou knowest he dies to me again when talked of. <laughs> Your father's image is so hidden you, his very heir that I should call you brother, most dearly welcome, and your fair princess, goddess. Oh, alas, I lost a couple that twixt heaven and earth might thus have stood, begetting wonder as you, gracious couple, do. And then I lost all mine own folly, the society, amity too of your brave father, whom though bearing misery, I desire my life once more to look upon. By his command have I here touched Cecilia, and from him give you all greetings that a king and friend can send his brother. And but infirmity which waits upon worn times has something seized his wished ability. He had himself the lands and waters twixt your throne, 
and his measure to look upon you, whom he loves, he bade me say so, more than all the scepters and those that bear them living. O oh, brother, most dearly welcome, as is the spring to the earth. The blessed gods purge all infection from our air whilst you do climb it here. What might I have been, might I a son or daughter now have looked upon, such goodly things as you? Most noble sir, that which I shall report will bear no credit, were not the proof so nigh. Please ye great sir, Bohemia greets you from himself by me, desires he to attach his son, who has his dignity and duty both cast off, but from his father, from his hopes, and with his shepherd's daughter. Where is Bohemia? Speak, here in your city, I now came from him. I speak amazedly, and it comes my marvel in my message, to your courts, whilst he was hastening in the chase, it seems, of this fair couple, meets he on the way, the father of this seeming lady, and her brother, having both their country quitted with its young prince. Camilla has betrayed me, whose honor and whose honesty up till now endured all weathers. Lay it to his charge, it's with the king, your father. Who, Camilla? Camilla, sir, I spake with him, who now has these poor men in question. Never saw a wretched so quake, then kneel. They kiss the earth, forswear themselves as often as they speak. Bohemia stops his ears and threatens them with divers deaths and death. O oh, my poor father, the heaven sent spies upon us, will not have our contract celebrated. You are married? We are not, sir, nor are we like to be. My lord, is this the daughter of a king? Well, she is, when once she is my wife. That once I see by your good father's speed <laughs> will come on very slowly. I am sorry, most sorry, you have broken from his liking, and as sorry your choice is not so rich in worth as beauty that you might well enjoy her. Dear, look up. Though fortune visible and enemy should chase us with my father, power no doubt hath he to change your loves. Beseech you, sir, remember since you owe no more to time than I do now with thought of such affections. Step forth, mine advocate. At your request, my father will grant precious things as trifles. Proceed you, sir. May you present at this relation? I was by at the opening of the fardel, heard the old shepherd deliver the manner how he found it, whereupon, after a little this, we were all commanded out of the chamber. Only this, methought I heard the shepherd say, he found the child. I would most gladly know the issue of it. I make a broken delivery of the business, but the changes I perceived in the king and Camillo were very notes of admiration. They seemed almost with staring on one another to tear the cases of their eyes. There was speech in their dumbness, language in their very gesture. They looked as they had heard of a world ransomed or one destroyed. A notable passion of wonder appeared in them. But the wisest beholder, who knew no more but seeing, could not say if the importance were joy or sorrow, but in the extremity of one, it must needs be. The news, Rogero? Nothing but bonfires that all coal has fulfilled. The king's daughter is found. Such a deal of wonder has broken out within this hour that ballot makers could not, pr could not be able to express it. This is the Lady Paulina Stewart. He can deliver you more. How goes it, sir? This news, which is called true, is so like an old tale that the variety of it is in strong suspicion. Has the king found his ear? Most true. If ever truth were pregnant by circumstance, that which you hear you'll swear you see. There is such unity in the proof. The mantle will queen her mind, her jewel about the neck of it. 
the letters of Antigonus found with it, which they know to be his character, the majesty of the creature and resemblance of the mother, the affection of nobleness which nature shows above her breeding, and many other evidences which proclaim her with all certainty to be the king's daughter. Did you see the meeting of the two kings? No. Then have you lost a sight, which was to be seen, cannot be spoken of. There might have you beheld one joy crown another, so in such manner that it seemed sorrow wept to take leave of them, their joy waited in tears. Our king, being ready to leap out of himself for joy of his found daughter, as if that joy would now become a loss, cries, Oh, thy mother, thy mother, then asks Bohemian forgiveness, then embraces his son-in-law, then again where he his daughter was clipping her. Now he thinks the old shepherd, which stands by like a weather-bitten conduit in many kings' reigns. I've never seen such another encounter, which lames report to follow it and undoes description to do it. What, pray you, become of Antigonus that carried hence a child? Like an old tale still, which will have matter to rehearse, though credit be asleep and not an ear open. He was torn to pieces with a bear. This about to the shepherd's son, was not only his innocence, which seems much to justify him, but a handkerchief and rings of his, which Paulina knows. What became of his bark and his followers? Wrecked in the same instant of their master's death and in the view of the shepherd, so that all the instruments which aided to expose the child were even then lost when found. But oh, the noble combat that twixt joy and sorrow was fought in Paulina. She had one eye declined for the loss of her husband, another elevated that the oracle was fulfilled. She lifted the princess from the earth, and so locks her in embracing, as if she would lock her in embracing, so that she might no more be in danger of losing. The dignity of this act was worth the audience of kings and princes, for by such was it acted. One of the prettiest touches of all was when, at the relation of the queen's death, some swooned, all sorrowed. If the whole world had seen it, the woe would have been universal. Are they returned to the court? No. Some would speak to her and stand in hope of answer. Thither, with all greediness of affection, are they gone, and there they intend to sup. I thought she had some great matter there in hand, for she has privately twice or thrice a day, ever <coughs> since the death of Hermione visited that remote house. Should we stay there, and with our company, peace the rejoicing? Who would be thence that has the benefit of access? Every wink of an eye, some new grace will be born. Our absence makes us unthrifty to our knowledge. Let's along. Now if I had not a dash in my former life in me, what preferment dropped on my head? I brought the old man and his son aboard the prince, Told him I heard them speak of the fardel, and I know not what. But he, at that time, overfond of the shepherd's daughter, who began to be very much sick, and himself led a better, extremity of weather continuing, this mystery remained undiscovered. But tis all one to me, for had I been the fine daughter of the secret, it would have relished among other discredits. Here come those I've done good to against my will, and already appearing in the blossoms of their fortune. Come, boy, I am past no children, but thy sons and daughters will be all gentlemen born. You are well met, sir. You denied to fight with me this other day, because I was no gentleman born. See you these clothes? Say you see them not, and think me still no gentleman born. You are best say, these robes are not gentleman born. Give me the lie, do, and try whether I am not now a gentleman born. I know you are now, sir, a gentleman born. I and have been so any time these four hours. And so have I, boy. <laughs> and so you have. But I was a gentleman born before my father, for the king's son took me by the hand and called me brother. And then the two kings called my father brother. And then the prince, my brother, and the princess, my sister, called my father father. And so we wept. And there. <laughs> There was the first gentleman-like tears that ever we shed. We may live, son, to shed many more. Aye, or to wear hard luck being in so preposterous a state as we are. I humbly beseech you, sir, to pardon me all the faults I have committed to your worship, and to give me a good report to the prince, my master. Prithee, son, do, for we must be gentle. Now we are gentlemen. I will, prove, I will prove so, sir, to my power. Hark, 
the kings and the princes, our kindred, are going to see the queen's picture. Come, follow us. We'll be thy good masters. O oh, good and grave, Paulina, the great comfort that I have had of thee. What, sovereign sir, I did not well and meant well. All my services you have paid home, for that you have vouchsafed, with your crowned brother, and these, your contracted heirs of your kingdom, my poor house to visit. It is a surplus of your grace, which never my life may last to answer. O oh, Paulina, we honor you with trouble, but <laughs> we saw not that which my daughter came to look upon, the statue of her mother. As she lived peerless, so her dead likeness, I do well believe, excels whatever yet you looked upon, or hand of man hath done. Therefore I keep it lonely, apart. But here it is. Prepare to see the life as lively mocked as ever so sleep mocked death. Behold, and say tis well. I like your silence. It the more shows off your wonder. But yet speak, first you, my liege. Come to not something near. Her natural posture. Chide me, dear stone, that I may say indeed thou art Hermione. Or rather, thou art she in thy not chiding, for she was as tender as infancy and grace. But yet, Paulina, Hermione was not so much wrinkled. Nothing so aged as this seems. Oh, not by much. So much the more our carver's excellence, which lets go by some sixteen years, and makes her as she lived now. As now she might have done. So much to my good comfort it is, as it is now piercing to my soul. I am ashamed. Does not the stone rebuke me for being more stone than it? O oh, royal peace, there is magic in thy majesty, which has my evils conjured to remembrance, and from thy admiring daughter took the spirits, standing like stone with thee. And give me leave, and do not say to superstition that I kneel and implore her blessing. Lady, dear queen, that ended when I but began, Give me that hand of yours to kiss. Oh, patience, the statue's been newly fixed. The color's not dry. My lord, your sorrow was too sore laid on, which sixteen winters cannot blow away. So many summers dry, scarce any joy did ever so long live. No sorrow but killed itself much sooner. Dear my brother, let him that was the cause of this have power to take off so much grief from you as he is able to piece up in himself. Masterly done. The very life seems warm upon her lips. The fixture of her eye has motion in it, as we are mocked with art. There's an air comes from her. What fine chisel could ever yet cut breath? Let no man mock me, for I will kiss her. Good my lord forbear. The readiness upon her lip is wet. You'll mar it if you kiss it. Stain your own with oily painting. Shall I draw the curtain? No, not these twenty years. So long could I stand by and look her on. Either forbear, quit presently the chapel, or resolve you for more amazement. If you can behold it, I'll make the statue move indeed, descend, and take you by the hand. But then you'll think, which I protest against, I am assisted by wicked powers. What you can make her do, I am content to look upon. What to speak, I am content to hear. For it is as easy to make her speak as move. It is required you to awake your faith. Then all stand still. On, those who think it is unlawful business I am about, let them depart. Proceed. No foot shall stir. Music, awake her. Strike. Tis time. Descend. Be stone no more. Approach. Strike all who look upon with marvel. Present your hand. When she was young, you wooed her. Now in age, is she become the suitor? Oh, she's warm. 
If she pertain to life, let her speak, too. Ay, and make it manifest where she has lived, or else have stolen from the dead. That she is living, were it but told you, should be hooted at like an old tale. But it appears she lives, though yet she speak not. Mark a little while. Please you should interpose for madam. Kneel, and pray your mother's blessing. Turn, good lady, our Perdita's found. You gods, look down, and from your sacred vials pour your graces upon my daughter's head. Tell me, mine own, where hast thou been preserved? Where lived? How found my father's court? For thou shalt hear that I, knowing by Paulina that the oracle gave hope thou wast in being, have preserved myself to see the issue. There is time enough for that. Go together, you precious winners all. Your exaltation partake to every one. Good Paulina, lead us from hence, where we may each one leisurely domain an answer to his part performed in this wide gap of time since ere we were dissevered. Hastily lead away, 